God ordains women. Quote, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. The number of names together were about an hundred and twenty. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. End quote. Acts chapter 1, verses 14, 15, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and verses 14 to 18. Quote, In the city of Portland the Lord ordained me as his messenger, and here my first labors were given to the cause of present truth. After a period of despair, the blessed Savior revealed to me his love, and brought joy and happiness to my soul. When I was but a child, the Lord placed upon me a burden for souls. I worked earnestly for the conversion of my playmates, and at times ministers of some of the churches would send for me to bear testimony before their congregations. After the great disappointment, the Lord revealed himself to me in a special manner, and bade me bear his messages to his people. End quote. Review and Herald, May 18, 1911. Introduction the Seventh-day Adventist Church is currently facing a crisis that is bound to forever change the character of the Church. The issue in the controversy, which is not at all a new one, is the ordination of women to the Gospel ministry as pastors and elders. The matter has come to a head due to the action of the Pacific Union Conference of SCAs, with the support of other conferences in the North American and European Unions, deciding to ordain women as pastors an action which has met with serious disapproval of the General Conference of STAs. As we shall see herein, the matter turns on the question of authority, both in the leadership of the Church at large and in the local churches. One aspect revolves around the concept that the General Conference is the final arbiter of such matters, and not the local conferences. Another facet, and that which is the far more significant one, involves the greater issue, that of God's delegation of authority in the whole male-female relationship, in the home, in the church, and in society at large. It is this subject that we will address herein. Those who are outspoken against the ordination of women, some even within the Pacific Union Conference, PUC, itself, have put forth their arguments as though their presentations of the matter are without fault. Among those who are foremost in their opposition, are those at the independent ministry Amazing Facts, headed by Doug Batchelor, who is also a pastor in the PUC at a SDA church in Sacramento, California. Doug Batchelor, via email addresses collected through the Amazing Facts website, sent out an appeal for people to sign a petition against the ordination of women in an email dated July 13, 2012. It seems obvious that because of the respect he is held in by many who have been blessed by his and the Amazing Facts Ministries, many are going to side with his position and accept what is put forth by him and those with him without a substantive examination of the issue. Asking people to sign a petition amounts to nothing more than an attempt to place the voice of the people where the voice of the Bible should be. This is especially strange and sad in light of the fact that Doug Batchelor not long ago told me that he did not consider himself to be a Bible scholar. Therefore, as we are admonished to, quote, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, end quote, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, we will herein review the points they raise, not only in the light of the traditional understanding they attach to them, but also from certain perspectives they are overlooking or not even considering. 
But before we address their points, we will take a fresh look at what the Bible has to say about the gospel ministry as it relates in New Testament times, and certain changes it went through during the falling away. This is most important in determining whether the current structure and practices of the SDA ministry are after the Bible example, or whether they still contain some elements that only have their roots in the customs and traditions that were brought in during the falling away, when, after the time of the apostles, the little horn of Daniel 7 had power to wear out the saints and thought to change times and laws. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. Of course, we pray that the readers will lay aside all preconceived ideas on the subject and allow the Holy Spirit to be their sole counselor and the final judge of the matter. In order to get a clear picture of the gospel ministry in the early church, and especially as it concerns women, we need to consider the context of the times of Jesus' first coming and the attitude of Jewish men towards women. It is generally understood that at the time of Christ's birth, the nation of Israel was at the lowest state in its long and turbulent history. This is especially true in regard to the way their men thought of the standing and rights, or lack thereof, of women. The Jewish men, though, were certainly not alone in their general attitude towards women. The Jewish men have even somewhat codified their disdain of women in something known as the Ten Curses of Eve. Within the various renditions of that list were the thoughts that women were not to be seen in public with their heads uncovered, were to be virtual prisoners in their houses, and were not believed in matters of testimony. Also, that they were not to be taught Torah, religious instruction, beyond an understanding of the practical aspects of Torah and the rules necessary in running a Jewish household. Yet, on the other hand, rabbinical literature contains some statements that may be seen as laudatory of women. The Talmud states that greater is the reward to be given by the Almighty to the righteous woman than to righteous men. Ten measures of speech descended to the world. Women took nine. Women are light on raw knowledge, i.e., they possess more intuition. A man without a wife lives without joy, blessing, and good. A man should love his wife as himself and respect her more than himself. When Rav Joseph heard his mother's footsteps, he would say, Let me arise before the approach of the Divine Presence. Israel was redeemed from Egypt by virtue of its, Israel's, righteous women. A man must be careful never to speak slightingly to his wife because women are prone to tears and sensitive to wrong. Women have greater faith than men. Women have greater powers of discernment. Women are especially tender-hearted. From these things, we see that in the days of the early church, there were widely varying views concerning women among Jewish men, such as there is today among men in general. Many of those praiseworthy attributes mentioned above certainly would be of value in the gospel ministry. In his email, Doug Batchelor gives a link to a website named Christ or Culture, http colon forward slash forward slash www.christorculture.com. It is their basic position that the reason why the PUC and others in the North American division of SDAs want to grant women pastors is due to cultural societal influences women's lib and women's rights, rather than biblical principles. But what they aren't taking into consideration is that we are in the times of the restitution of all things and that God is working to restore the co-dominion Adam and Eve had before the fall. So, while the devil is doing his best to counterfeit and frustrate that work, God has his own agenda that will prevail though the gates of hell be set against him. In one of their website's sections, 12 Interesting Facts About Leadership in the Bible, dated June 12, 2012, they present 12 points in support of the idea that only men should receive ordination as pastors. We will address those points later as there are other matters to first consider, those being what is the significance of ordination, and what is the purpose of the gospel ministry. In another section, What is Ordination, dated May 30, 2012, they present the following concerning what they believe ordination to be. Quote, ordination is defined as the investor of clergy with pastoral authority or sacerdotal power. The practice of ordination in the modern era is drawn from biblical examples, where especially chosen men were set aside and consecrated as priests, apostles, or pastors, 
and spiritual authority was publicly recognized and conferred upon them to administer the sacred rites of the church, such as baptism, solemnizing a marriage, administering the emblems of the Lord's Supper, and overseeing the proclamation of the word. End quote. Therein we find what it is that is really at the heart of the matter. It is well known that the Catholic Church limits its priesthood to men, though it was not always the case because they say only men can represent Christ in his office as priest. They, along with Protestants, do that so as to invest those men with spiritual authority to perform marriages, baptize people, lead out in the Lord's Supper, which varies widely from denomination to denomination, and other such sacred rites that they deem to be the work of the gospel ministry. Quote, the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are two monumental pillars one within and one without the church. Upon these ordinances, Christ has inscribed the name of the true God. End quote. Manuscript 271 and 2, 1900. Though those at the Christ and Culture website say that, quote, the practice of ordination in the modern era is drawn from biblical practices, end quote, we will see that such is not the case in regards to two of the above listed sacred rites, baptism and the Lord's Supper. That is, in the case of baptism, the issue of who has the spiritual authority to officiate at it, and in the Lord's Supper, the supposed spiritual authority exercised in the performance of it, and the results thereof, are not based on any biblical examples, but rather on later innovations that crept into the Church. The significance of these things should not be underestimated because of the radical changes the Church went through during the falling away, and that the Reformation, begun by Luther and others, and those who followed after them, was still in progress at the time the Advent movement began, and is ongoing today. Quote, the Reformation did not, as many suppose, end with Luther. It is to be continued to the close of this world's history. Luther had a great work to do in reflecting to others the light which God had permitted to shine upon him. Yet he did not receive all the light which was to be given to the world. From that time to this, new light has been continually shining upon the scriptures, and new truths have been constantly unfolding. Luther and his co-laborers accomplished a noble work for God, but, coming as they did from the Roman Church, having themselves believed and advocated her doctrines, it was not to be expected that they would discern all these errors. It was their work to break the fetters of Rome and to give the Bible to the world. Yet there were important truths which they failed to discover, and grave errors which they did not renounce. End quote. The Story of Redemption, page 353. To see if its practice in the modern era is truly based on biblical examples, we will first look at baptism. While it's common among Catholics and Protestants alike for their priests, ministers, pastors, and in some cases even elders, to baptize people, they, with very few exceptions, prohibit those who are called deacons from doing so. Therefore, we will look at what the Bible has to say about deacons and baptism, to see if what we have been given to understand about them, their work and their spiritual authority, is truly found in the Bible. We are looking into this issue concerning deacons and their biblical authority because the term is applied to both men and women in the New Testament relative to the ministry of the gospel. The word diakonos, deacon, in its varied forms appears 30 times in the New Testament and is translated ministers 20 times, servants 7 times, and deacons 3 times in the KJV. It is applied to Jesus, Romans chapter 15, 8, Paul and Apollos, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, Tychicus, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21, and Colossians chapter 4, verse 7, Epaphras, Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, and Phoebe, a woman, Romans chapter 16, verse 1 and 27. Concerning Jesus being a deacon, it is written, quote, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister, diakonos, deacon, of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, end quote. Romans chapter 15, verse 8. Many of the more modern translations use the word servant in that verse rather than the word minister but none of them use the most direct translation of the Greek word, that being deacon. Why? 
because using the most direct translation, deacon, in reference to Jesus would undermine the modern era thinking in regard to the true biblical order of the ministry. The variations ministers, servants, and deacons in English translations of the word diakonos, deacon, give different shades of meaning to the word so that Paul's original usage of the word has lost its consistency. That is, it is certainly true that Jesus was both a minister and a servant. It is, though, equally true that he was a deacon in Paul's undefiled usage of the word in relation to the gospel ministry. When those who read or heard Paul's letters read to them in Greek, they would not have thought that he was speaking of Jesus, himself, Apollos, Timothy, Tychicus, Epaphras, and Phoebe, a woman, in the sense of them all equally being anything other than ministers, servants, deacons in the gospel ministry, and certainly not a lower order of clergy or laymen, as is the notion held concerning deacons in the modern era. Jesus said, quote, Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, diakonos, end quote. Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, Mark chapter 10, verse 43. So, whether he or she is a leader of a local congregation or the worldwide church, we would do well to do as Jesus said, and let him or her be your deacon, minister. Even those known as elders today are nothing more than overseeing deacons, ministers. Seven deacons? Quote, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Permanus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. End quote. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. It is generally thought that the appointment of those seven men in Acts 6 to oversee the daily ministration to the household of faith was the establishment of the office of deacons, which is understood to be a lower order of the clergy, or laymen active in minor functions of the ministry. Prior to that time, there was really only one office in the ministry of the Christian church, that being that of the apostles. Though all of the disciples, including the apostles, were active in some level of teaching, evangelizing, and even pastoring, there is no record of there yet being any others than the apostles who were formerly ordained to any of those positions within the gospel ministry. Prior to that time, it was only the apostles that had authority both spiritually and temporally in the church. See Acts chapter 4 verses 34 and 35. One of those seven men in Acts 6, who many called deacons, was Philip, who is known to have exercised the gifts of teaching and evangelism, Acts chapter 21, verse 8, and chapter 8, verse 27, along with performing miracles and casting out demons, Acts chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Philip also baptized a man, Acts chapter 8, verse 38, something which most deacons today, especially those in the SDA church, are prohibited from doing, but which pastors and other elders commonly do. The Holy Ghost chose Philip to meet with that Ethiopian, inspired him to preach the gospel to him, and ordained him to baptize him. Likewise, Stephen, who is also considered to have been one of those seven deacons, and the one whom Ellen White called foremost among those seven men, Acts of the Apostles, page 97, and who did the work of an evangelist and performed, quote, great wonders and miracles among the people, end quote, Acts chapter 6, verses 5 to 54, would, by the standards of many churches today, be prohibited from baptizing anyone because he would be considered to be only a lowly deacon, a layman, one without the spiritual authority to do so. So, here we have a biblical record of someone, Philip, 
who would not be considered to be a pastor or even an elder in our modern era thinking, doing that which he would have been prohibited from doing today in the SDA church, i.e., baptizing someone. If such a significant departure from the biblical example in regard to what is considered the work of deacons today is so apparent from a simple review of what the Bible really has to say on the subject, it should not be surprising to find the same concerning deaconesses and their true spiritual authority in the ministry of the gospel. The only way to understand this disparity is to look closer at the fundamental facts concerning the gospel ministry. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 we read, quote, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. End quote. The Greek word translated ministry therein is diakonia, and is derived from the word diakonos, minister. Another form of the same word also appears in Acts chapter 6 verse 1. Quote, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. End quote. So those seven men who were appointed to oversee the daily ministration were truly deacons, ministers, in the strictest biblical definition of the word, but not in the way the word has been redefined since that time, and how it is held among SDAs today. The matter hinges on the issue of what kind of authority is recognized in the calling. Technically, there is no such thing as the office of a deacon other than as it is applied to the work of any one of those five gifts mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, or of the other gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 28. That is, whether one is called to the work of an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, all are, in the simplest and strictest use of the biblical meaning of the word, deacons, ministers. This can be understood by examining the verses in which said office is mentioned. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 10 and 13, KJV, the singular Greek words diakon yetosan, verse 10, and diakon esantes, verse 13, are translated into whole phrases. Quote, let them use the office of a deacon, end quote, end quote, that have used the office of a deacon, end quote, respectively. The words, the office of a deacon, are not in the Greek, nor are they actually supported by the context. If the translators had not added private interpretations to the translations in order to justify the current practices of the church in their day regarding the office of deacons, those verses would simply read as follows, quote, Let these also first be proved, then let them minister, being found blameless. End quote. Verse 10. Quote, For they that have ministered well purchase to themselves a good degree. End quote. Verse 13. Even in the beginning of that same chapter, where Paul gives the qualifications for a bishop, an overseer, he is only speaking of an overseeing deacon, minister, nothing more or less. This is most important in the context of one who is qualified to work in the gospel ministry. That is, anyone who truly qualifies to be called a deacon, a minister, has the spiritual authority to exercise the gifts they have been given. That includes women, for even Phoebe is called a deacon, Romans chapter 16 verse 1, and thus must have been a part of the gospel ministry. Diaconia. At that synod of Laodicea, 363 to 364 AD, a law was enacted which reveals the progress of the falling away in which certain men were exalting themselves above others, including women, in regard to the ministry. It is Canon 20, quote, It is not right for a deacon to sit in the presence of a presbyter, unless he be bidden by the presbyter to sit down. Likewise, the deacons shall have worship of the subdeacons and all the inferior clergy. End quote. The word presbyter therein is where we get the word priest. Thus, that law is saying that the deacons, ministers, are not to sit in the presence of a priest unless bidden by him to do so. The whole high minded notion expressed therein is nothing more than a perversion of what Paul said regarding honor do those in positions of responsibility. Quote, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, 
especially they who labor in word and in doctrine. End quote. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Such was another sad step in the falling away from the principle of letting the greatest among us be our deacon that came from men seeking to have preeminence over others. 3 John, verse 9. As we shall see as we progress herein, the desire of men to have preeminence over one another, especially as it applies to men dominating women in general, and as it relates to the gospel ministry, has its roots in another misapplication of God's word. As this presentation is concerned with women in the ministry, diaconia, we will look further into the subject of deaconesses. Quote, Deaconess, a term appearing once, Romans chapter 16, verse 1, RSV. The rendering of the Greek, diakonos. Here a feminine noun which means literally servant or helper. Phoebe is mentioned as a diakonos of the church at Sencrea. The word and its usage in this text suggests that the office of deaconess may have been established in the church at the time Paul wrote the book of Romans. End quote. SDA Bible Commentary, page 261. It is notable that the authors of that dictionary chose to leave out the fact that the word diakonos is translated ministers more than twice as many times than it is translated servant. Since it has been admitted that there were women who were ordained as deaconesses, female ministers, diakonon, in the apostolic church, and in many churches today, we will examine this office in some detail. Here is what the Catholic Church has to say about the history of deaconesses. Quote, there can be no question that the deaconesses in the 4th and 5th centuries had a distinct and ecclesiastical standing, though there are traces of much variety and custom. Further, it is certain that a ritual was in use for the ordination of deaconesses by the laying on of hands, which closely modeled on the ritual of the ordination of a deacon. For example, the apostolic constitutions say, Concerning a deaconess, I, Bartholomew, enjoin, O bishop, thou shalt lay thy hands upon her with all the presbytery and the deacons and the deaconesses, and thou shalt say, Eternal God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Creator of man and woman, that didst fill with the Spirit Mary and Deborah, and Anna and Hulda, that didst not disdain that thine only begotten Son should be born of a woman, thou that in the tabernacle of witness and in the temple didst appoint women guardians of thy holy gates, do thou now look on this thy handmaiden, who is appointed unto the office of a deaconess, and grant unto her the Holy Spirit, and cleanse her from all pollution of the flesh and of the spirit, that she may worthily accomplish the work committed unto her, to thy glory and the praise of thy Christ. End quote. The Catholic Encyclopedia, page 651, 1907 to 1914. This is not the new Catholic Encyclopedia. Licensed to Preach On pages 249 and 250 of the Ellen White compilation, daughters of God, there is a list of 31 women who were licensed to preach by the STE Church between 1878 and 1910 in the U.S. and other countries. Of them, it is said that, quote, some of the women listed above were employed by the church, others were self-supporting, end quote, page 250. To be employed by the church means that they were paid with a tithe, in accordance with Ellen White's counsel, quote, women to receive wages for their work. There are ministers' wives, sisters Starr, Haskell, Wilson, and Robinson, who have been devoted, earnest, whole-souled workers, giving Bible readings and praying with families, helping along by personal efforts just as successfully as their husbands. These women give their whole time and are told that they receive nothing of their labors because their husbands receive wages. I tell them to go forward and all such decisions will be revised. The word says, The laborer is worthy of his hire. Luke chapter 10 verse 7. When any such decision as this is made, I will in the name of the Lord protest. I will feel it my duty to create a fund from my tithe money to pay these women who are accomplishing just as essential work as the ministers are doing. And this tithe I will reserve for work in the same line as that of the ministers, hunting for souls, fishing for souls. I know that the faithful women should be paid wages as it is considered proportionate to the pay received by ministers. 
They carry the burden of souls and should not be treated unjustly. End quote. Manuscript Releases, Volume 12, page 160, 1898. And Daughters of God, page 106. As Ellen White was always quite emphatic that the tithe was to be strictly used for the support of the ministers, what are we to think of her call therein that women who do the work of the ministry should be paid by the tithe? Was she attempting to set up something that was wholly new within the gospel ministry? That certainly was not the practice of most of the churches, Protestant and Catholic, in her day. Yet, when we take into account that all tithe-paying ministers are only biblical deacons, then the women who she said were to be paid from the tithe must be, in the biblical definition of the word, deaconesses. So, while the SDA Church does ordain deaconesses today, they do not allow them to have the true biblical spiritual authority inherent in that calling to the ministry. The reason why that is involves another subject that we will look at shortly. It appears that God was using Ellen White to restore another principle and practice in the ministry of the gospel that had been done away with during the falling away. Oh, but how slow men have been to respond to God's leading. In the current era, the issue of ordaining women came before the General Conference in 1990 and was supported by many in the North American and European divisions. It was opposed mainly by those in the Latin American and African divisions. While some have been trying to say that those who are in favor of women's ordination are doing so merely because of cultural influences, it is really those who have been opposing it who have been acting from their own cultural bias that primarily comes from the influence of the Catholic Church in paganism rather than the Bible. We will address this point more fully further on. This brings us to that which brought about the redefinition of the word deacon, and the notion that deacons are somehow an order of clergy or laymen inferior to those specific positions mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. That is, the establishment of a distinct priesthood whose function is to officiate in the Mass, the counterfeit of the biblical Lord's Supper. Quote, the scriptural ordinance of the Lord's Supper had been supplanted by the idolatrous sacrifice of the Mass. End quote. The Story of Redemption, page 334. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, Paul lists the various functions of those involved in the work of the ministry, which is for the perfecting of the saints and for the edifying of the body of Christ. What is notably missing from that list is the word priests. One would think that if Christ had set apart certain persons, i.e. priests, to officiate in a mystical bloodless sacrifice, i.e. the Mass, or a symbolic mock meal, the common Protestant Lord's Supper, whose very words and actions invest the bread and wine taken in memory of Christ with such a special sanctity that any leftovers must receive special treatment, they would be mentioned in that list, but they're not. Note, we're using the term mock meal for the common mode of keeping the Lord's Supper because that is the term used in the SDA Bible commentary for such and is quite descriptive of the practice. We are bringing up this issue of priests and ordained pastors and elders being generally the only ones who are thought of to have the spiritual authority to consecrate the bread and wine because it is believed that only certain ordained males can represent Christ in his intercessory office of priest, and that officiating in the Mass, or the Lord's Supper, is an intercessory priestly act due to the presumed consecration of the bread and wine thereof through the words and actions of those who lead out in it because of the spiritual authority they are thought to bear. The correct understanding of this aspect is crucial in regard to the question of the ordination of women as elders and pastors. That is, the spiritual authority associated with the ones leading out in what is known as the Lord's Supper is a more coveted thing than any other function in the Church. Were this not so, why does the Roman Catholic Church insist their priesthood is the only one with a true apostolic succession and that they are the only ones who maintain the true Eucharistic mystery, to the extent that they say that all other churches are not true churches because of their lack of those things?